Hello, everyone. Hello. This is Svetlana from Marco 7. Thank you all for attending today's webinar, Data Democratization at Lightspeed, a utopian vision or an achievable goal, brought to you in partnership with Brilio. Before we begin, I would like to cover a few housekeeping items. As you can see, at the bottom of your screen are multiple application widgets you can use. All the widgets are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. If you have, if you have any questions during the webinar, you can submit them through the Q&A. We will try to answer as many as possible during the webinar, but if a full answer is needed or run out of time after the webinar. A copy of today's slide deck and additional help materials about data democratization. We encourage you to download any resources or bookmark any links you may find useful. For the rest of your experience, we recommend using a wired internet connection and closing any program browser with the platform technical issues located in the help widget at the bottom of your screen. Please expect an email within two hours after the webinar with links to download the webinar slides and recording. At this point, I'd like to briefly introduce you to our moderator and host of the webinar, Sandhya ba ba Balakrishnan, Region Head Data and AI Radio. Sandhya, it is over to you now. Thank you so much, Svetlana. Uh, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Brillio webinar to discuss the phenomenon of data democratization. Uh, today, we discuss the aspirations many leading enterprises are pursuing towards realizing this vision and the realities of this journey. Uh, I, I, am, I have an esteemed panelist of speakers today uh, joining us. I uh, would love to take a moment to introduce each one of them. Uh, uh, Jatin, uh, would love to hear from you first. Thanks, Sandhya. Hi, my name is Jatin Janwani, CTO for KFC UK and I. And one of my passion is to add value through data. So it's a pleasure to be on this webinar today. Thank you for that. Uh, Subir? Hi, everyone. Subir Saxena. I am the head of commercial delivery for Novartis. I have been in Novartis for the last 18 years, and I'm based out of Dublin, Ireland. I'm passionate about digital transformation. Amin, over to you. Yeah. Uh, my name is Amin. I'm head of applied science and analytics at Zalando. And as you can see from my title, uh, what I love to do is how can I empower leaders, people in organization to make the best decision with the help of data, either through machines or through decision making support systems. Thank you, Jatin Subir and Amin for joining us. Very excited to have this conversation with um, all of you. Uh, before we get started, a uh, quick agenda uh, for the day, everyone, we will briefly share uh, Brillo's perspective of what we are seeing in the industry uh, around this theme of data democratization. And I promise you, we won't take much time before we hear from our esteemed uh, panelists shortly after that. So, so today the webinar is sponsored by Brillo, a leading digital transformation services provider. We have a deep focus in data and digital and have footprint in Americas, Europe, and India. We tap into the potential of digital and data to help our customers build brands and products that customers really love, and in the process, create a foundation for an ent uh, agile enterprise. Today, like I mentioned, we will be discussing two key aspects. One, our perspective of what's happening in the industry, and second section focused on hearing from our panelists about what their experiences have been in driving the phenomenon of data democratization for each of their industries. We will cover two dimensions of this journey. One, of course, you know, the upside, the aspirations behind uh, adopting data democratization, the enablers in this journey. But of course, data has, is a topic uh, of controversy as well many times, right? So how do you really tread this area with caution, uh, especially as the applications of data explored, there are conversations about privacy and responsible use of AI, right? Uh, so we will talk both about the aspirations as well as the guardrails and the uh, uh, risk mitigation that enterprises are adopting to ensure uh, data democratization is responsible, but equally uh, a high value initiative uh, across the enterprise. So like I mentioned, we will start with a quick uh, uh, point of view of what we are uh, observing in the industry across industries we are serving, 
uh, strategies are shifting towards ensuring resilience for the evolving uh, macroeconomic situation. Data is emerging as the biggest enabler in staying close to customers during these uncertain times. And the insights to understand shifts in preferences and buying powers, methods to nudge the customer along the journey uh, with the right information and incentives, and providing them the best experience despite supply chain challenges are all today powered by data products. The other critical consideration for enterprises today is financial prudence and driving cost effectiveness. RPA needs to be backed by AI and BI capabilities to really unlock creative opportunities to optimize uh, cost today. Siloed experiments in data is passe to achieve the objectives that I mentioned in the previous slide and to really scale analytics, it is important to commit to data users a journey of superior user experience. Further, the sense of urgency and desire for speed to value supports the business case for democratization of data very strongly. Brillio's recipe for the transformation for towards data democratization includes three pillars. One, we lean on ensuring we build reusability uh, during the uh, transformation journey and build tools to help the users discover data more seamlessly. The second critical pillar we ensure we bring to our customers is ensuring a high experience in consuming data. We try to define the user journeys and experiences upfront, uh, bring, uh, design the change management upfront so that it's not data democratization and concept, but it is looked at from the lens of the users. The third key pillar is governance, and governance not just the traditional data governance, but governance in the applications of data and AI as well. Uh, here, this is a brief uh, view from uh, Brillio's perspective. I'm excited to hear from our panelists about what they think about uh, the key upsides and enablers that they have been leveraging in their enterprises uh, to enable data democratization. To start the conversation, I would love to hear from uh, each of our panelists how data democratization is enabling their respective organizations, uh, what some of the marquee initiatives that have been making uh, a business impact, and how um, uh, they are measuring uh, success. Uh, Subir, uh, why don't we start uh, uh, from uh, with you uh, with this question? Sure, so sure, thanks, thanks for the question. A very interesting space. Um, as Novartis, you know, we are a scientific powerhouse as a pharmaceutical company. Uh, data is literally our lifeblood. And uh, we generate a lot of data consciously as part of clinical trials and a lot of the others as a byproduct of the activities that we do. Um, so for us, you know, de democratization of data is key because, you know, for all the aspirations that you shared, Sandhya, we, we espouse for the same and we are working towards that same direction. But I think before we start the journey, one of the most important elements for us to think through is, you know, why should we democratize the data? What's the use case for it? And who should have the access? Because it's also about, you know, uh, managing the data in the most effective manner and looking at the education and the learning and the tools available for them to uh, be able to use that as well. So I think there's a lot of work that we do in terms of um, how we enable and make this data available to our associates uh, internally. So given the size of our organization, there are dedicated teams of data scientists. There are, you know, uh, a whole bunch of services organizations around analytics. There are, you know, end scientists and users as well. So we uh, really look at different use cases and, and look to see how we make our data available to them in the most usable format and not just in a, in a raw format. So in many of the cases, we have a marketplace from where we abstract and you know, we give them access more to that rather than a raw data that they would, uh, you know, need to have access to. Um, in terms of, you know, what has uh, been the impact of this, uh, you know, like I mentioned, um, we live in a world where uh, we have to come up with results faster than what has happened before. That means that we need to have a constant flow of information, data, and how do we leverage that to pick up insights? So we've been using this for a lot of insight generation across the board. Um, and then, you know, the success is really measured use case by use case in terms of our ability to take the right decisions, our ability to take decisions on time, our ability to really have uh, uplift into our top line uh, for commercial insights that we provide. So uh, multiple different, very clear uh, KPIs uh, and data plays, uh, plays a, a very important role to enable that our newer systems, our AI and ML, 
uh, get the most out of it. So I hope that answers, um, you know, our point of view at Novartis where we have and hand it over to, uh, to Jatin. Thanks, Saveer. Um, so in terms of uh, the question, I mean, let me just first talk about KFC. I mean, uh, at KFC, we've got about 1,000 restaurants um, and 50 restaurants are owned by KFC, 950 are owned by 32 franchisees. So we've got in all, right, if you include KFC UK and 32 franchisees, 33 business partners working together and 1,000 restaurants, right? So there's a complexity uh, in that. And then uh, the other aspect is data, right? So yes, we do have uh, sales data, transaction data, but we also capture a lot of customer data to understand what customers are saying about us and about our restaurants and about our food. We also capture operations data. So at KFC, we capture data from prior to the customer's tray or delivery bag, and we know where a product has spent time and, and how it has been managed. So, so it is very important for us to look all of that data. Now, if we just centralize the data and do not allow everyone to use the data, it'll be a nightmare. So the only way to work at this scale with the data that we have and with the number of business partners we have and the rest we have is to democratize the data. So we, we democratize our data across cross-functional teams, our restaurants and our franchisees. And, and it does wonders for us. I'll give you an example. I mean, recently we uh, start, uh, kicked off an initiative where we started capturing all the customer data in terms of, you know, we all use Uber and Deliveroo's of the world, and you can provide feedback there. So we started bringing all the data from aggregator platform about customer feedback and complaints into one place. Club did with all the data that is out there on social platforms, Google reviews and, and the likes, and then shared that with the restaurants. So now a restaurant is able to see what the customers are talking about their restaurant. So it has enabled them to work out what people are talking and improve there and then. They do not have to wait for a week for someone to gather the data and someone to create a report and send it to the restaurant and the restaurant could to look at it. They have access to all the data. And the next step for us is now to I mean, summarize it and then give them next best actions as well uh, around it so that they do not spend time analyzing the data themselves. So, so the point I'm trying to make is, I mean, data democratizing, data democratization does wonders, and uh, we have seen it across various initiatives. I've just shared one of the initiatives with you. And in terms of how we measure success, I mean, uh, the example I shared, I mean, describes that as well. But for us, what matters is, I mean, we look at operational metrics. So we know that a restaurant that looks at the data well and looks looks at the metrics well is good at customer experience. You see your complaints, customers are more happier, and in turn, your transactions and our sales are better. So you see, I mean, the uh, use of data uh, adding value overall in customer satisfaction, operational effectiveness, and of course, in the, in the end, uh, do better sales. Amin would love uh, to hear please. from you as well. Yeah, I, I can take it. I'm not sure how much I can add uh, after having such a good answers from Jatin and Sabir. But um, I'm going to focus on how enable your teams uh, in, in this part of the question. And apart from having the prerequisite of a digitalization and data government, which is a very uh, short answer for this question, I'm going to focus on the second layer of what helps in the second uh, aspect. As, as they mentioned already, having transparency of what is available in an organization, even if you don't have access, even if, if you need to go through hassle of act, getting an access for different data set because it is sitting in a different department in your organization, is still knowing about the availability of this data and transparency, that's a very crucial enabler from my perspective. And then once we have the transparency and then we can go through those steps to enable them to access those data. Having transparency and, and, and access is going to result in integration of data. And once you have a good, more holistic data, as a data scientist and as an analyst, you can really improve the way that you can, you can deliver actionable insight or improve your machine's decisions. And I'm going to uh, come with my example because I'm in the world of marketing. By integrating internal data of the pricing and availability with our steering, investment steering decisions, just integrating extra data and adding them as a feature in our models. We managed to improve our profitability by 2.5%, just, 
just this one, not, not improving model, not, not improving anything, just integrating data and power our decision making. And that's why it's going to be very important on how we are harnessing this, uh, this democratization of the data between different departments. So hopefully that cover up a little bit more. But in essence, uh, what I mentioned, if I'm going to put a cherry on top, is the advanced visualization. So make sure when you have integrated data, when you have these different data sources available, put the best, make the best of your analysts and engineers to bring this information to the surface in a very easy manner to digest from people across the whole department, across the whole business. And then you can see how the insight is going to flourish at different corners of the business. It's very inspiring to hear such diverse applications, you know, across industries, be it a re relatively more regulated life sciences or, you know, consumer brands that we love, how, uh, you know, data democratization has helped breaking silos across the organization or, you know, you, uh, you, it's being used to take feedback from the consumers or to, you know, improve internal operations. I think it's amazing to uh, hear some of these experiences. Uh, so, uh, Many of your organizations look relatively mature uh, in this journey. In our experience, many times the next playing field becomes monetization of data, right? Uh, how are you exploring data monetization? Uh, are, are new services under consideration, uh, you know, to really monetize data further than, you know, just internal uh, applications? Uh, Jatan, maybe, you know, we can start this conversation with you. So in terms of monetization, right, it's an interesting point. Uh, for us, we're not looking to sell our data to make money out of it. Um, that is not on our roadmap and uh, it's not going to be our intention as well. What we're looking at is uh, creating data products and services. Uh, so I, talk, I spoke about insight as a service, analytics as a service, uh, while I was answering your previous question. So we're looking at data products and services that our cross-functional teams or franchisees and restaurants can subscribe to. And the intention is to get to a point where the subscription can in turn fund further development. So we want data to be self-funding in our business model uh, so that we do not have to get money from elsewhere uh, and provide services. And that will enable us to do more in this space in terms of R&D and provide better services as well. So that's, that's, that's how we are looking at it overall. Yeah, we've just started our journey in, in terms of thinking about how this is going to look like. We've built some prototypes. Um, it's a journey, so so we'll see how it goes. Amin would love to hear from you as well on this topic. Yeah, I, I think I would echo uh, even what uh, Jatin mentioned. We are not selling data. This is not the way of monetization. This is all about how we can use the best this data to create services or product. That's that's what I have to mention. But the very first important thing is to mention that if it has, if you have some sort of data which is around customers. The consent of the customer of using that data is crucial. We, we have a really strict policy of privacy preserve, and we are not going to make sure of using any data if you don't have any consent. But now, going back to if you are going to make the best of this data, there's two elements. Either you are going to monetize your data internally or externally. If it's an internal monetization, you can break it into are you going to employ the human in the organization, or are you going to create machines or product out of it? If it's a human, it's, it's a very easy one. The analyst job is going to drive actionable insight out of this data or bringing this information to the surface. So people who need to use those information for making decisions on a day-to-day -day basis make the best of this information. On the machine side, there are so many different applications. We, we are in the blooming uh, time of data science in the world and having a, a bunch of data scientists in every corner of the business they can either innovate uh, models, uh, predictive models, uh, optimization engine, improve the measurements. And given this way, we are improving our decision making in a big scale. But I'm just going to bring one example of external uh, monetization of your data. And this is where you create a product to enable either your customers or partners to make the best decision. Uh, I have this example from my previous work at booking.com. And maybe you can even go there and you can see what kind of services are available. But simply, these two products that I'm going to mention. So one of them was about the price prediction for the partners when they are going to give the accommodation out there. 
So the hoteliers, people who are going to give their hotels, they can use this product to make sure that they, they pick the right price for the right time uh, when they are putting their, uh, their, their portfolio out there. And the second example of the external monetization is when you enable your customer to make best decisions. One of these examples is if you tell your customers that the availability of this specific place in the next time is going to be very diminishing or if the trend is up or down, so you help your customer to make the decision. They don't come back later to see if it's not available or it is in a higher price. You help them to make the best decision right at the right time. I mean, That's you made great. an interesting point about, uh, sorry, Sandhya, I mean, if I can, uh, you made a good point about internal and external data. One other trend I'm seeing, which I remembered uh, uh, of listening to you was that there's a trend of data collaboration now between different companies as well uh, coming in, into play, where different organizations are trying to come together and share their data among themselves to drive insights and provide better experience to the customers or B2B, B2B business as well. So that's an interesting trend to watch as well. That's very encouraging, Jatin and Amin, that did our data is being used responsibly, be, responsibly by brands, and you know the terminology of democratization is not really used uh, loose and fast, right? Uh, clearly, it's for the benefit of the partner ecosystem and for customers that data is being used, and with the intent of making data self-funding. So uh, that's very encouraging to hear. Uh, with that, you know, I also want to focus the discussion a little more on the technology enablers. Uh, in this journey, uh, the kind of technology enablers that have helped your organization, uh, you know, really democratize data and commercialize data assets, uh, and an important aspect of change management, which is closely associated to uh, technology change as well, right? How have you experienced uh, different people reactions, uh, uh, you know, during the transformation journey, and what have you been your uh, experience and insights in managing change more uh, effectively? Uh, Subir would love to maybe start this conversation with you. Yeah, yeah so I think um, what we have done really in terms of enabling us to move down this path is uh, looked a couple of years back in terms of creating a data lake um, and, you know, so that we can start to bring together a lot of the uh, information that we need, the data, you know, uh, raw data that we need and really start to land them right, mix them right, you know, and then, you know, be able to kind of, you know, refine and, and, and be able to then leverage them on more insight generators, et cetera. So there's a, there's a whole bunch of investments that we made right from you know, data warehousing te techniques or technologies, looking at data marts, looking at how do we uh, use the latest uh, software available for our overall um, you know, data quality related uh, activities. And so we find them. Uh, and there's also been a, a drive to kind of you know, really look at that advanced uh, visualization uh, that Amin was talking about. So really getting, you know, investments done on our visualization, looking at um, elements on storage, uh, scalability. Uh, so I'm not necessarily calling out any package names or, or uh, softwares, more in terms of where we invested, so the entire value chain, to enable that we are successful in our marketplace uh, and enable that data marketplace to be um, providing the right quality of data to the people who want to use that. So across the board in, in, in multi, multi million uh, spend across uh, various tools that uh, help us land the data right, help us clean the data, have the right quality implementation of the business rules, uh, store them right, store them for scalability, have the compute available, um, and then you know uh, have them served to the teams that need that in the most effective way in which they can use. Uh, Justin. That, that's a great answer, uh, uh, absolutely, uh, Subir. Uh, Jatin would love to hear from you as well. We've partnered with you some, uh, in this transformation journey. Would love to hear your thoughts uh, as well. So yeah, I, mean, I, yeah, I think Subir has covered quite a bit already. Yeah, in terms of um, uh, our landscape, what I'd say is one big challenge that we've had is because you've got 1,000 restaurants in the UK and some are located in areas where you do not have enough connectivity or good connectivity, it becomes a challenge to democratize as well as receive data. So one of our focus has been on uh, connectivity and uh, network infrastructure in terms of um, enabling our restaurants and uh, our cloud network to be able to receive and send data. So now we have reached a point where we can, if needed, run a restaurant on 5G as well, thanks to 
the progress that telecom has made. Um, and of course, cloud uh, uh, access to cloud and cloud native VR is already where we're using Snowflake and Metellian and on AWS and DataSync and other other um, technologies. Uh, so, so that all is uh, making a big, big impact. In terms of uh, how people react to change, uh, what I'd say is uh, it depends on how you, you've defined your problem. If, if a problem uh, is meaningful enough for people, then people do engage. And I'll share an example, and we were recently doing a prototype uh, with you guys were involved as well. Uh, and the prototype was to uh, Prove visualization. I'm, I'm in covered the covered this point uh, very uh, nicely about data visualization, and uh, and what we did uh, during that prototyping process was we engaged our business partners, our franchises, into it, and the impact of that was that whatever we created as a result of that was instantly liked by everyone. Now <laughs> they cannot wait to have it. So it's a different problem to have. Uh, we, uh, and engage them uh, in driving that change such that they now want that change sooner than, than we, can, we can provide. So, um, so yeah, so all I'm going to say is that if, if, if we are able to engage, define a problem meaningfully, engage the people at the right time, then it helps in uh, rolling that change out or rolling that transformation out. Uh, otherwise, if solution is leading the problem, then it never works. That's a great point, uh, Jatin. In our experience, also the more we can bring design thinking and you know bring collaboration into the process and move away from the mindset of build it and they will come. Uh, I think you know the more successful and you know uh, open to change uh, people are. Uh, uh, now we want to move to the uh, you know we discussed quite a bit about uh, the upsides of uh, data democratization, right? Uh, but there are definitely a lot of complexities in this journey as well. Uh, around which guardrails needs to be set up, certain challenges needs to be addressed slightly differently, right? Uh, we already, uh, both Amin and Jatin earlier spoke about uh, coexistence of external data sets with enterprise data as well. Um, uh, you know, it would be interesting to hear how we are ensuring value from uh, these external uh, data sets and while bringing it into enterprise data, how are we harmonizing it with enterprise data so that it's still easily usable and not adding more chaos uh, to the ecosystem, right? Uh, data exchanges uh, were briefly mentioned here as well. Uh, so would love to hear how data exchanges in action have actually helped uh, in this process. Uh, Life Sciences have, has been an early adopter in this space. So uh, Subir, why don't you uh, kick us off on this topic? Sure, Sandhya. So um, we do survive on a lot and, and we need as part of our core business a lot of external data sets, you know, be it in terms of what we get from IQVIA, in terms of prescription related information and many other external data sources that we use uh, to be able to kind of, you know, look at our commercial activities. And also to the point that Justin was mentioning previously, there is a desire in a consortium that we've created where we're also looking at leveraging our R&D data uh, and sharing that across for certain, uh, you know, medicines that we're kind of, you know, co-developing with our partners uh, and other pharma companies. So there is, uh, there are multiple uh, use cases where uh, we have the uh, opportunity and the need for us to use this external data. And like I mentioned to you, in terms of the entire framework that we've created of a data marketplace within Novartis, we bring in uh, all of these external data sets uh, in the format in which they are into a landing zone, which doesn't necessarily then straight away get into our you know, systems that need to leverage it. And then we progress this data, you know, from the landing zone with multiple refinements and, you know, business logic and, and use case you know, information being laid on it so that, you know, that refinement is done and it's mixed along with the internal data sets where we need um, them to, you know, coexist as we further analyze that uh, together with the external. Uh, and that is then carried out in a subsequent layer uh, when, when the enrichment of the data has been done. And only after we know that it's been enriched, it's been mixed, and you know it's in a space where the external data uh, and the internal data can then be processed jointly to create the outcomes that we need, it then is available for the consumption teams and the down 
downstream applications for them to use. So it's a very well-controlled, well-defined with the right kind of guardrails in place. There's already quality of data being checked when it's kind of coming in from external. Uh, and then we you know, mix it with, with uh, full accountability and the setup in, in you know, what we own. There is scalability available through cloud platforms in which we've set this up so that you know, those use cases can, can then um, have all the information that they need. And um, to the exchange part of it, you know, we're using Snowflake as well. So with many of our providers, um, you know, the information comes to us now much more rapidly, much more real time uh, through the sharing that we have available through the cloud. Uh, and that enables us to be faster in our you know, progression of the data and usage of the data. So where we had previously batch processes and very you know, um, time-bound uh, ways to do it, we're starting to get more and more real time. We're starting to get more and more um, online and uh, uh, available to take decisions with uh, almost real time data. That's great, Subir. Uh, it sounds like you know you have really set up a very well thought through structured foundation to uh, enable this. And uh, of course, Snowflake seems like the darling uh, when it comes to this topic across industries uh, these days. Uh, Amin, uh, you mentioned this area in your prior response as well, so would love to hear your thoughts on this one. Uh, definitely. But if you let me, I'm just going to flash back. Why do we need to do that? Uh, I, I would start with this in my mind. And we have this motto in an enterprise. If you are going to be successful as an entrepreneur or as an enterprise, you need to start with having customer in mind. And how on earth you can sit in your own shop and know everything about what customer is doing. So that's why if you are going to have a holistic view of what customer in, has in mind, you have to try to create a 360 view of what the customer is going to think of, what, what is the ecosystem that customer is inside, and how he or she go through the process of decision making, and then how you're addressing uh, his or her need given the product or services that you're providing. And that's why creating that holistic view of the customer requires for us not only to look our our enterprise data, but also look at what are other things missing from the customer perspective that I have to bring it in. And by the way, I don't believe we have done a great job so far. There is a really long way to, to be in a position to say that we have done a great job, but I can see this is moving toward the right direction. But let me start with some examples. I, think, I, I believe example can bring the, the whole concept uh, minds forward. So imagine if you are going to make a purchase in the fashion store, you are going to have a new trouser or a new coat. What usually you would do is that not only consider the price you see in one of the shop, customers are much more savvy these days. So they, they, they check multiple providers and they check, check the prices. So if you don't know what the competitive price is, how the competitors are giving the price for the same product that you are providing, you will not be able to, to stay strong in the position of the uh, selling point. The other thing that we have noticed surprisingly, uh, which totally shifts the performance, is, is weather. We, we know when the weather, when the season change, when the weather get colder, people will start to say, oh, actually I need a, 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 a new coat because I don't believe my last year coat is, is doing the, uh, the satisfaction I, I wanted, I want something new. And even if you think of these two examples that I mentioned, these are the things that you don't have internally. You have to bring this data in house and add it to the existing data you have to be able to make the best decision. But I'm going to be, uh, bring a couple of more examples. Uh, from my previous experiences, and one of them is, think of the uh, Japan. You, you are going to think, if for a specific city, people are going to travel, so you are going to increase your availability or price for, for one city. Big chunk of shift in terms of the, the, uh, the uh, uh, people's requiring accommodation in my previous job was by events. So when the concert happened in one specific place in, in uh, Kyoto, you would see a very sudden shift of demand from the customers. So what we could do simply, we find a provider of the events data across the globe, bring those information, plug it into our decision making. So in, in advance, we could tell whether in that specific city this year, at that specific time, you're going to increase of demand because we know that there's going to be a huge event happening over there. Another good example is about the brand abuse. So you might have uh, uh, 
your domain and people are going to come your domain when they think that they know the brand. For example, Zalando. You, you know Zalando, you may go to type in Zalando and, and go there. But there is some people that are sneaky doing the, the brand abuse by creating a domain name very similar to your name and then sh shifting those traffic to the different places. Even they might be affiliate marketing, they just bring you to back, but they create a backdoor for themselves to abuse this situation. So what we could do, there are some companies out there that they are surfing information and they see if there is any specific domain name that dr drive traffic very similar to your domain, and then you can detect how much of traffic you are going to lose from their perspective, and then decide whether it's easier to buy that domain or just report them as an abuse and stop them for doing this. You can see that using different data sources, which is not in your enterprise, you can you can utilize it in so many different ways, uh, a different part of the business. Hopefully those examples uh, was helping to, to answer the question. Very Amazing interesting and relatable. Yeah. Jatin, yeah. you were saying something. Sorry, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm amazing examples. I mean, um, in, I mean, first of all, before I start in survey, I mean, I like your idea about data marketplace. I'm going to steal that in some ways. <laughs> I hope I don't have to pay the royalty. Um, and uh, I mean, you gave an example about predicting demand, right? I mean, uh, we've got a very similar example at KFC as well. So what we're doing is, I mean, uh, we have to constantly look at uh, how do we open new, where should we open new restaurant? Uh, uh, and there's a lot of scope uh, in the UK to open more restaurants. So, and it, it was always a challenge, right? How do you determine whether uh, the site that a franchisee has brought to you um, is a good site or not? And how much money it will make? So what we did recently was we uh, we partnered with, uh, with the company to create a tool that uh, brings data uh, from the country, i.e. demographic data, mobile, uh, mobile phone data, footfall data, weather data, uh, retail estate data in terms of what's where, uh, in terms of retail estate and schools and hospitals and different different types of uh, um, offices and, uh, and um, organizations. And then combined it with our sales data in that area to create a model that can help us predict what the sales could be at a new site which has got a similar pattern uh and and that's now gone live and it's it's helping us a lot to figure out uh whether the proposition that is being brought forward by a franchisee uh, is good enough or not and we are we are hel helping them use that data as well to to work out how good that site could be and and we are using that data to also work out if a restaurant is not doing in a particular area is it because of the operations or is it because of the, uh, the, the space that they have and what they have around them? Uh, so, so yeah, so bringing different data sets together can add significant value. And one other um, area we are exploring now that, I mean, in food business, and you, we all know that aggregators are playing a big role. Uh, so it's all about, okay, how do we now, how can we collaborate with aggregators and, and use the data that they have and we have to try some insights that can add value. It's early days. I mean, we're just still uh, exploring how we can help um, each other. But I think that's an area where uh, we'll see more uh, as uh, as more and more uh, companies start thinking about data collaboration and um, insight analysis through that collaboration. Very relatable and interesting experiences, Jatin and Amin. Uh, I agree uh, whether it's just one reason to buy more clothes for whimsical customers like uh, me, of course, and, you know, I'm sure bringing in uh, more external data would be important to, you know, understand uh, customers better um, and, you know, really uh, deliver products that customers uh, uh, love. Uh, before moving to our next question, which is the last question, I just want to quickly remind uh, our audience that uh, the Q&A is open. Uh, so please feel free to ask your questions. We have some more time left. Uh, as time permits, would love to take any questions that uh, you might have uh, with the panel as well. So with that, uh, moving to the last question uh, uh, of the panel discussion, uh, uh, would love to hear from each of the panelists what guardrails they are establishing to govern the democratized data as well as the application of this data. Uh, 
pharma has all uh, has been regulated there are industry guardrails of course uh, but would love to hear from you subir to start off with uh, as an organization wh what are those guardrails that you know you have established to ensure uh, while the data is democratized it's being used responsibly absolutely so um just picking up on on jatin cuz he like the concept i'll probably go back to the marketplace as well so given that that's the entry point for a lot of the people to kind of come in and raise their request for what they want to use the data for uh there is a very well controlled process to uh you know take on a request in terms of why a certain team or a function uh will need access to this data and uh, we go into the details in terms of trying to understand what kind of data do they need what would they use it for uh what's the end point that they need to reach with this data and you know we qualify all of that to then say okay um, how do we best serve uh this team and if this is the end objective that they want to achieve what are the data sets that we have and what mixing that we need to do so that they can have the information that they need to move forward right so we control them quite tightly uh we also control in terms of the people who have access to this data and how trained they are so we've got a learning curriculum uh in place so that in case uh, somebody wants to start becoming a power user um and uh, you know wants to engage with that data at a deeper level that that is something that they've completed uh and that we have and we subsequently obviously track you know all kind of access uh, through it through your our identity and access management capabilities that you know we know who's leveraging which part of the data and how they're using it um so you know sufficient guardrails to preserve what we use it for um and like i mentioned at the start um we have to think quite a lot in terms of um giving access to any user it has to be someone who's equipped has the reason and the skill to be able to do uh, what they need to do and then absolutely they can play along with the data that they have we've got a big team of data scientists internally that use that for a lot of hypotheses uh looking at you know how they want to leverage this data to create the outcomes that they have um and we work with them uh very closely to support the outcomes that they want to reach and the scalability and the compute power that they have which is why we're also based ourselves on the cloud uh you know with uh, enough uh, uh, scalability uh, available to help support uh, the needs that they have so that they don't necessarily they need to make local copies or do anything else uh you know to misuse that that data set as well so that's how we kind of uh, maintaining the uh, the guardrails and the setup around uh to enable that you know we we continue to move forward. basically Amen would you like to add on uh, uh, Yes I think so we covered pl plenty of the guard days so I'm going to put my lens only on one dimension which is um the the humanitarian part of it so the very first one is uh, as I mentioned earlier as well data privacy and, pro and and making sure that you're using the data that customer allowed you to use that that is essential so that would be one guardrail for making sure that this democratization is not going to violate any of the customers uh trust in the data that they have provided but the second one because now we have data we are going to use it for any uh, for, for a purpose and the way the most most of the time we use it is by using machine learning data science and ai now the 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 concept of fairness in ai becomes more and more in, more important as we are moving along in this field so making sure if you are if there is any bias in the data that we are democratizing we are utilizing we are using for our decision making making sure that this data doesn't pollute our decision in not in favor of human not in favor of a direction that if we if we would have a fair world we would decide this way for example there's there's so many example and article about the fairness in ai uh, that people and, and and audiences they can they can search and find about it but specifically i can say even if you are using the mobile phone or the type of mobile phone people are using it may introduce some biases toward a specific groups of people so it's very important to be conscious about this concept and making sure that fairness in our decision making is going to be there because at the end we are going if if you are going to be successful in the long run we have to have the trust of customers and the trust of customer doesn't happen by making sure that we are in a very fair and safe world that's that's my lens for for this question 
Thank you, Amin. In fact, at Brilio also, we have developed frameworks for fairness of AI and responsible AI, and we strongly recommend that to customers who are on this journey. Uh, Jatin, would you like to wrap us up on this question? So on guardrails and governance, I think I think it's critical, right? I mean, uh, not only for uh, the use and value of the data, but also to protect it. Um, uh, I mean, these days, data security has become very, very important, as we all know. So it's it's important to protect it, and it's also important um, to comply with the regulations. So the data governance plays an important role in that. A few, a few things that we are doing uh, with respect to um, data governance and, and the guardrails around it, we are focusing a lot on uh, data ownership and accountability for different data domains. Um, because uh, as you know, I mean, that's a sensitive area. Organizations do tend to struggle in establishing that um, accountability and ownership because te technology doesn't need to be the owner of all data domains. Uh, it, it has to be spread across the business. So that's one. Uh, data lineage is very important uh, in all the businesses. It's important in our business as well, because now that we are getting data from different sources, it is important that we understand what's coming from where and where it's ending up. Uh, so we had talked about uh, access control, which is important for us as well. Our data catalog is important. Uh, data glossary is important. So there are lots of aspects of data governance that we're looking into. We are also exploring new tools that can be used uh, to improve our uh, data governance overall and make us more effective. And this is something that we are not just looking at from KSC UK perspective. Data governance is important, uh, important and a, a collaborative effort across YUM, which includes different brands um, as well as KFC. Um, so, so yeah, uh, overall, uh, it, it is a critical aspect. Uh, and finally, what I'd say is uh, training I mean, uh, people or data literacy is very important in terms of what you've got and how to protect it. Because unless uh, we have educated our people about what data we have, what value they can get out of it, uh, and how should they be protecting it, there is no point. So that is an important focus area for us. Uh, um, um, we got to improve uh, data literacy overall in all organizations. Thank you, Jatin. Uh, we have a few questions from the users, given we are uh, we have almost 10 minutes left. Let's take a few uh, user questions uh, questions from the audience as well. Um, uh, I think we have an interesting question here from Louis Oliveria. Uh, how to ensure that analytic self-service does not lead to chaos? Uh, so BRU seem to have a really structured foundation uh, in your enterprise for sure. Uh, would you like to uh, add some more thoughts as to you know how you have ensured uh, self-service does not mean chaos? Sure. So, and, and, and that is a very big topic we constantly keep on debating in terms of how you know uh, far out do we want to go with uh, citizen developers, with citizen data scientists and you know really engage the um, uh, you know the people in the in the company. And um, I'd probably, you know, uh, are on the side of caution given the nature of data that we have, because a lot of that is patient information, a lot of that is clinical trials data, a lot of that is information which is not necessarily playable and readily shareable. So what we've therefore done is, with that in mind, we have, um, you know, put that framework that I've spoken about in the, in the meeting today, so that it does not get necessarily abused. Now... That doesn't mean that we, uh, that's the way we would color and label everyone and not necessarily we can go down that path. But we do have a clear use cases. Like for example, for our data scientists, we make a lot much more data available so that they can you know, really kind of you know, mix and match, play around with the information that they need and come you know, respond to the hypothesis that they have. But uh, to an average Joe, we would not necessarily be exposing uh, you know, the data or creating the capabilities um, for, um, you know, data democratization uh, for that individual until unless there's not a clear need for it and the person is not trained, uh, you know, literate in terms of how to use that data uh, and informed on how to also safeguard and move on with, uh, with the enterprise assets that we have. So uh, I'm not against it. I think there are definitely use cases where, you know, liberating it and enabling people to work with it would create wonders. But in the regulated space that we are, we want to leverage that data. It is our lifeblood, and we want to see that it gives us further insights, but in a controlled manner and with power users and with the right training and with the right setup around it. 
um, we would like to uh, look to do it. Uh, that's also as a as a factor in nature of the space in which we operate, and not necessarily that we hold ourselves that this is totally going to create chaos. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a factor of educating, and then you can really have wonders out of it. And to your that's point, great. Sabira. I think, uh, sorry, Sandhya, um, um, the point that you made about education and the structure that you have is, is a very valid point. And what I realized through, I mean, uh, some of the initiatives we have done is if your stakeholders and people who are using the data are aligned on some of the definitions, it, it reduces the chaos. Uh, if people are coming up with their own definitions and own interpretations, then it could lead to a massive chaos. So it is, I mean, it is very important, uh, as you said, Sabir, uh, that if you have that structure and education around it, it can reduce chaos. Um, how, how much, I mean, it depends on the organization, but yeah, when, when you expose such things, there is always some chaos. I agree, uh, Subir and uh, Jatin. Many times, uh, data and self uh, self service tends to be approached as a technology initiative, and all the change management around education, training, literacy, etc., often gets overlooked. Right? Uh, bringing all of those dimensions together can definitely uh, lead to uh, you know a more stable self service uh, framework which can scale. Uh, let's take maybe a couple of more uh, questions from the audience. Uh, there's another interesting question from uh, Hyval Evans. Uh, data cleansing and normalization seems a consistent challenge regardless of technology. Uh, do you agree? Uh, Jatin, you spoke about many high impact use cases that KFC has delivered, uh, but would love to hear from you. Does data cleansing and normalization still remain a challenge or uh, have you figured ways to uh, streamline that better? A sh short answer is it's always got a challenge. And I think Amin touched upon it as well, and I'll come to uh, the point that Amin uh, covered earlier also. Um, yeah, data has evolved over the years, right? Now, I mean, uh, we've, we've gone from structured data to unstructured data, and, and it, customer data is also continuously evolving. Operations data is continuously evolving. We've got IoT now. Uh, so, I mean, there's more and more data every month, every year, every week. Um, and that makes cleansing even more difficult. You have to keep deploying different cleansing and normalization techniques uh, to ensure the data quality is maintained, to ensure that your uh, stakeholders and users uh, can trust the data that you're providing and the data remains secure as well. Um, so yeah, it's not 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 easy. Uh, it, it takes time um, and you have to understand your data really well to be able to do it well. But the other challenge that you, we have uh, is uh, removing bias from the data. Now with the use of AI ML, um, it is becoming even more important. I mean, uh, there have been incidents, uh, and I mean, touched upon it as well, where data biases have caused problems. I mean, uh, Google image recognition had an issue some time back. Uh, uh, there was an inquiry with respect to Goldman Sachs credit card application processing as well. So, uh, uh, so cleansing and normalization has got extended to, I mean, how do you remove bias from the data so that you can get the right outcome from the data? and the models that you're creating. Absolutely, Jatin. Uh, approaching, given the how the applications of data has you know, evolved, just looking at it from sheer normalization, I think does not suffice. I think you know, we just have, we really have to think about biases and drift and making sure uh, you know, as we apply data, it's relevant uh, for the applications that it gets used for as well. Uh, thank you for that addition. Uh, Maybe we can take one more uh, last question from the uh, audience. Um, Umar Latif has asked, um, any experiences to share on data virtualization, um, success stories where data users have received convincing benefits of data? Um, uh, Amin, would you like to take that question? Um, yeah, I can take that. And, and uh, by the way, really good question coming up. Um, I, uh, I really enjoyed the questions from the audiences. So hopefully, even we can have it even more time next time from the question coming from the audiences. Um, I, the short answer is yes, but I, I don't want to answer. I, I don't want to give fish. I, I want to uh, teach how to fish. And if I'm going to think about the good good example that the, it worked well is that someone in the organization needs this information 
if you are talking about visual, visualizing this data for the um, democratize for the for the monetization of the data in in inside the organization. So if we think this way, we go back to the same concept of you have a customer inside your organization who needs this information for a decision to, he's going to make or she is going to make to make an action upon this. So if 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 I go through the what I just mentioned is that. I'm going to create a process of this, which means find who's the customer of this visualization, who's the person who's going to use this data, and then go to that customer, try to understand what is his or her need. And you can find, I'm not going through on which platform you are going to use. It can be Power BI, uh, Data Studio, MicroStrategy. There are plenty of them, but there are more, more or less are doing the same job. So regardless, find what is the best thing that you can provide for that customer, but go through the cycle of starting with the prototype, the very first one, the Pareto uh, rule, 80% with a 20% effort, put it in front of the customer, get the feedback, improve it, and go for the next iteration of what is missing from there, get a good uh, feedback from the customer, and, and, and do this cycle over and over again. But if you are doing this cycle over and over again for the continuous improvement of this, uh, uh, this visualization, the answer of if it's working or if it's improving is about how many actions they are taking out of having access to this uh, visualization. So creating a, a feedback, a quantitative feedback loop, either by survey or by digitalization of this, which means how many times are actually people are coming and using this this thing and they leave. Regardless of how you get this, this information, making sure that you measure the success of this with a balanced scorecard. And this scorecard specifically here is that how many times people are taking action out of this. And this is from the customers coming. So I hope I, I didn't want to come up with an example because I can say, yes, we did it for, for this part of the business. We did it for making decision on uh, as an alerting system that we are overspending in, in part of the business and people should jump in to understand why the overspending happened. But I wanted to answer this question with a, with a set of process that give you the end result. Uh, hopefully that uh, answered the question of the audiences. And, uh, th and thanks for the good questions. Absolutely, Amin. Great answer, uh, as always. Uh, with just three minutes to go, maybe it's time to wrap up. Uh, let me first thank the panelists for joining us uh, today. It's been a very inspiring conversation uh, on this topic of data democratization. We covered fairly diverse uh, topics from very high impact use cases, which directly impact customers, as well as your own organization's top line and bottom line. We spoke about innovations, both uh, regarding uh, the platform and technology, as well as innovations such as marketplaces, exchanges, fairness in AI, uh, using AI to remove biases in data, right? Uh, but at the end of the day, I think it is really putting the focus back on the users and on the customers, right? And ensuring the right uh, experience, the right guardrails, the right literacy uh, and uh, change management programs are instituted. Really, that is what drives uh, the success uh, measures forward. Um, once again, thank you panelists for the insights that you shared today. And thank you, for being such a great audience and uh, you know responding with some great questions, uh, thank you all of you for your for the one hour that you spend with us. I wish you all a great day ahead. Thank you so much, and bye. Thank you, Sandhya. Thank you, and uh, thank you all for sharing these great insights and indeed, and for being so generous with your time today. Just a quick reminder to look out for an email within the next two hours with links to download today's materials. And if you would like to learn more about previous services and how they can help you with data democratization, you can book a meeting directly with them or request a demo through uh, widgets book a meeting and request a demo. We'd also like your feedback. So if you could take a, a minute to answer our very brief survey that will pop up on your screen at the end of the session, that would be very much appreciated. On behalf of Brilio and Marco Seven's webinars, we would like to thank you all for joining us today, and we do hope that you will be listening to us in our next webinars. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.